Welcome to State of the State. I'm John Calavalli, hosting this program and with us for part three of our conversations is Richard August. Of course, you know him as a person who interviews other people. But tonight, he's being interviewed by moi. <laughs> Welcome to State of the State once again as a guest. Dick I know. This is, I'm really getting used to this, John, you know? <laughs> yes. Thanks for having me back, John. You're, you're quite welcome. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to share with the people that we're going to be talking about a number of different things. Uh, uh, we'll be starting off with the presidents uh, uh, having uh, their first gathering together. I don't know if it's going to be a debate or a discussion. I'm sure you'll have some thoughts about that. And then we'll talk about some uh, other matters, uh, issues facing the candidates, facing the people in the, in, of uh, America and of our government. And then we'll talk a little bit about the wars that are going on and uh, our relationship to those, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the general agenda. Okay, let's do so, it. So, Dick, um, <clears throat> the presidential debate is on June 27th, and I want to make a note to our viewers that this particular interview will not be broadcast until after the election uh, so that our viewers can compare what they view and what we have to say about that. Um, and uh, we'll see how we've done, or you've done. <laughs> no. I, won't, I won't take any credit for it. Um, so I guess, uh, Dick, we'll start with um, whether or not the president, particularly uh, President Biden, will be able to stand for however long it is, uh, or whether or not they'll need to change the seating. So on that, you know, uh, question, where do you stand? Well, I think the format that's been agreed to is 90-minute debate with both candidates standing. Now, I understand that the Biden campaign is trying to put a little pressure on the sponsors for, for the debate to allow the, president, the candidates to have a, uh, a stool or something to sit on. Mm -hmm. But originally, that was, that was the agreement, was 90 minutes both standing. The other um, question that I have is that they've agreed to mute the microphone of the candidate who is not uh, being, uh, the question is not directed to. Mm -hmm. um, in some respects, I kind of like that because then they're not trying to talk over one another. But people who watch debates, I think, kind of like the spontaneity that can occur uh, and, and watch how um, deftly the people handle these interruptions and things going back and forth. That goes for both sides, both sides not, just, yes. not just one. But the other thing is they're not going to allow any opening statements. Now, typically in a debate format, each side gets a chance to have an opening statement of some sort, of some length. That'll, but no, uh, that's been uh, eliminated as well. Um, the debate is being uh, moderated by two of the people uh, Anchors, I guess you call them, from uh, CNN, which is so. I'm sure there are questions about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, both of both of them uh, have expressed in the past some animosity toward President uh, Trump. I guess you know. I just hope, and I, I really mean this. I hope that we don't see a debate where the moderators are interfering by al allowing one candidate to say things and maybe helping them along, coaching them, and then uh, objecting to or arguing with the other candidate. That's, that's not their role. I mean, they can ask them tough questions. They can try to make, a, uh, make it sure that we have a modicum of courtesy, and that's, that should be it. They shouldn't be interfering in, in what's going on in terms of actual 
uh, give and take between the candidates. And Dick, I might add that that really would not serve the purpose of a debate because one of the things about a debate is that we see how people interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I I've seen many, many debates in my lifetime, you have, and the ones that I've liked the most is when the two candidates were respectful of each other and uh, I remember some candidates actually saying, gee, that's a good idea. I'm going to keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, typically, a, a famous statement that will come out one side or the other that becomes part of the uh, folklore of the, the presidential sure. debates. You know, it's a, a great one-liner that they come up with. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, I guess the overarching question is, I mean, it's pretty obvious that President Biden is having some cognitive decline now, and is, is, he's, well, he's 81. Um, I think the question is going to be, if in fact he does not do well, and it, his, his difficulties uh, communicating and concentrating are become evident, what will the Democrats do? Who, who are they going to turn to? Um, I mean, they're pretty much all in now on, on President Biden, except that Biden's polling very low. Most of the polls are showing in the swing states that President Trump is leading, mm -hmm. and that's critical. I and mean, people, people have to remember um, that about six or seven states are going to decide who the next president is. And it's going to come down to about 300,000 voters who really are going to decide because of the Electoral College. Sure. Now, we can talk about the Electoral College for, uh, later, but, but that's the way it is. But that's the question. Who are they going to come up with? I mean, there's names being bandied about, like California Governor uh, Gavin Newsom. Uh, but it, he comes with a lot of baggage because ca California is not in the greatest shape economically. Um, there's other few other governors around they're talking about. But of course, the big question is, well, if Biden's not going to run. What about his vice president? Shouldn't she be in the running? The problem that Democrats have is that her polling numbers are even lower than, than Joe Biden. Yes. So um, there's speculation that at the convention, um, if President Biden is not the candidate, that there's going to be some effort to find someone else to be the vice presidential, uh, be the presidential candidate other than the vice president. Um, and do you have some thoughts on well, who I don't that know. I mean, might be? <laughs> it's just speculation, but I mean, there's names being bandied about. Sure. Will they turn to say, okay, Hillary, this is it. You wanted to be president. Well, here you go. We're going to give you another chance. I mean, there's all these stories about Michelle Obama standing in the wings. That's right. But most of the people that um, I listen to say that she really doesn't want it. She's not... She's not into being the president. She liked being the first lady okay. But who knows? Um, they've, they've certainly got to be very careful about who they choose and also recognize that it's highly likely that President Biden, if he's elected to a second term, is not going to be able to complete the second term, which means his vice president, whoever it is, will automatically automatically become president and 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 that's i think that's a, a concern that many americans have notwithstanding their political uh, standing what i'm saying is that that's a concern for democrats and for republicans mm -hmm. yeah um but i think the the fact that President Biden is, is now sequestered at Camp David, prepping for uh, this debate. His wife is out there on the campaign trail. She was in, I think, Philadelphia yesterday and Pittsburgh today. Um, the Democrats seem to think that the state of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, is in play uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, of swing, swing state. Um, but President Trump is out there on the campaign trail, very vigorous. He's getting people uh, enthusiastic uh, at reception. He go, he's going to places where he's un, he shouldn't be. For, if you think, New York City, Detroit. He's going to these places where he's being welcomed. 
by some people there. And I think that's a danger signal as far as the Democrats are concerned. Um, he is, um, he's, he's uh, not too much younger than President Biden, but my goodness, he seems to be certainly much in much better physical and mental uh, shape than the president. I mean, that's just and almost you know, obvious. I, I'm going to offer a perspective on sure. what you said. I, I think it tells a great deal about a candidate if he or she is willing to go to a place or places that are not necessarily working in that person's favor. Mm -hmm. Uh, that takes courage, and of course, there's always a possibility that you could change people's mind if they have a chance to view you and listen to you and, and even ask you questions. Yeah. I think um, what I sense is that the Democrats seem to be building their campaign around a couple of issues, John. Um, certainly, you've heard that they repeat this over and over again, that he's a convicted felon. Well. Yes, that's true, but if you look at um, that and you say to him, well, what was he convicted of? I don't think anybody can tell you because the judge didn't even tell the jury what he was being charged with because it's, it's very nebulous. It's very likely this will be overturned upon appeal, but nevertheless, that's one, one theme. And I don't think it's going to get a lot of traction with people who are aware of, of really what happened. Mm -hmm. um, We've heard the term, and I had this actually a discussion with a gentleman who's 95 years old about a week ago, and he said, he, if Trump gets in, he's going to be a threat to democracy. Well, that seems to be another theme that they're bringing out. Even President Biden brings it out occasionally. And I'd like to point out to our audience that the United States is not a democracy. We have a democracy means that every citizen has a direct vote in every issue. The only direct vote we have is for Congress. That's the only one. And that, that is why Congress, that branch of government, is the representative form of government. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the president, we elect electors from each state that meet in con a college and elect the president. So even the president is not a direct election, as, as much as some people think he should or she should. And then we have the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a, a nominated by the executive and confirmed by the legislative. Mm -hmm. So that's the way our system works. So we are really a representative republic. The only time we're a democracy is when we vote for Congress. You know, that's an interesting uh, truth. Uh, and uh, I, I suspect that sometimes we uh, forget that because we hear us democracy, democracy, democracy. But it is a, 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 a different term in reality. Well, in reality, if you look at the record, I think President Biden is a bigger threat to democracy than President Trump was. Now, why would you say that, Dick? Simply because he believes that by the power of the executive orders, he can go against the, what the Supreme Court has said and against what Congress has said. I mean, he, the executive orders are really instructions to the branches of the executive as to how, how, what the, they should be carrying out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that President Biden does not have the authority to forgive student loans. And immediately on that ruling, I recall him saying, well, we're, we're already at work out of workaround, which means somehow by executive order, I'm going to thwart what this co-equal branch of government, the Supreme Court, has, has said. Yes. Um, and that's only one. I mean, um, and as, as far as some of the other things that are being taken care of, if you will, by executive order, they're very questionable. and. Um, but he seems to think, and I think that is an inheritance almost from uh, President Obama, who seemed to think, he said, I have the pen. I have a phone and a pen was his famous thing that I'm going to issue, but to take care of this by executive order. That's interesting, Dick. Uh, yeah. President Biden um, has, is facing, I think, some, some questions of his own, however. Um, first is immigration. Um, it, 
it's pretty obvious to anybody who's paying attention that there are a lot of people coming across the border without any paperwork, if you will. They're undocumented, if you want to call them that. They're trying to call them migrants. But initially, the thought was, well, they're coming from Central America and Mexico. These are impoverished people. They're trying to get away from the gang violence in these countries, so they're coming here. Well, that's not true anymore. They're, they're coming from all directions. They're coming from Venezuela. They're coming from Somalia. They're coming from uh, uh, parts of Russia. They're coming from, they're finding them from Iraq and Iran. In large numbers. In large numbers. And even China. Now, these people coming in from China, uh, they have a separate, uh, there was a, a, a gentleman who went to the border, went across the border and followed these immigrants. And he came up and it, it is a very hazardous trip for part of the way. And I forget, they, they have a name for the path that they follow. But people do die on the, on the way. Mm. But they're paying these cartels, coyotes, I guess they're known as, to guide them along. But if, if they lose somebody, they don't care. I mean, they're, they're still getting paid. And there's fewer people they have to get across the next river. So they are going, and they get finally to a, 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 like a resting place before the final surge to the border. Well, this gentleman went to one camp that was mostly people from that had come up from South America and all, all of these. There was another camp that was exclusively for the Chinese. And you know, Dick, I believe I saw that yep. on 60 Minutes one evening. And it was like they were just walking up by this rock and yeah. They were home safe after that. Yeah. Well, this, this gentleman actually pointed out, I'm going to show you how, uh, our, our, talk to our audience about how ridiculous it is. It's, some people may not be aware of this. People come to the, the wall, if you will, where there is a wall. There are actually doorways with bells, doorbells. Hmm. And when they get there, the coyotes bring them to these entryways and they press the bell notifying the Border Patrol that we have a group of people that want to cross into the United States. And the coyotes, the cartel guys, leave. Border Patrol agents convene, converge on the place because they have to process these people, open the gate, and let them in. And then this, this processing that takes place is, is merely uh, a perfunctory screening. These people are not being vetted very closely, even although we actually are finding people on the terrorist list who have come through. Yes. <laughs> um, and as you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've had some really bad incidents with these, some of these guys who shouldn't be here, who have killed, they killed everyone from a mother to five to a 12-year-old girl. And They've uh, virtually always been people that have been deported once or under deportation orders and have not gone. This is unacceptable to mo or should be to most Americans. Yes, it certainly should um, be. We say we're a nation of immigrants. That's true. But your forefathers and mine came here wanting to become Americans and to contribute to uh, the American way of life. And they encourage their children, the next generation and the next generation, to be Americans. Yes, you can be proud of your heritage, whether it's Italian or Eastern European or whatever it is, that's fine. But you are encouraged, you are an American, first and foremost. And, and, we, and we accepted that for the most part. And you know, part. Dick, I can remember when uh, members of my family who were immigrants, mm -hmm. and some and, and parts of the family were born here after you know yep. my grandmother and grandfather came here, and uh, they talked about uh, people that didn't have all the documents, and they were told, "Sorry, you can't stay mm -hmm. here. You're going back." Sure. Or even if they had a cold or other sickness, they weren't allowed in. Right. Uh, and so it was. It was a different uh, situation then. And it seems to me that uh, the law 
was enforced then. It doesn't seem to be enforced anymore. Well, it isn't, because, because President Biden, on the day he was inaugurated, signed nearly 100 executive orders reversing most of what uh, President Trump had put in to secure the border. John, people have to understand, too, there's a difference between being a refugee and seeking political asylum. Someone seeking, and I, uh, some years ago, I uh, went to a lecture by a gentleman who was from a Western African nation, I don't remember which one, but he was a news reporter who had made some uh, reports unfavorable to the administration, the dictator in power, and the, they came to one day and said, you better leave, the secret police are coming for you. Hmm. And he got on a bus and very fortunately got out of the country because at the border, the, the police officer that got on the bus looking for him was a, a guy that had gone to high school with, and he let him go. Oh. And he spent, he spent, John, over two years in a refugee camp in a neighboring country in Africa being vetted, and they had to wait until a, um, an agency in Rhode Island who helps these immigrants arranged for him to come here to Rhode Island and then, and only then, well, he was allowed to come here. And the understanding was they had, a, they had a place for him to stay and they had a, a job for him. And he had like, three, and I, this is from, directly from him. They said, you have three months, we're gonna pay your rent, we'll get, get you food, but in three months you have to start contributing to yourself. That's a refugee. What's happening is these millions of people are coming across claiming political asylum, yes. which means they are under direct threat. Now, economic hardship is not grounds for political asylum, but these people are being coached somehow by somebody or some group to say, I, I want to seek asylum, in which case the Border Patrol people process them through and say, okay, here's your cell phone, here's a hotel where you can stay, here's, some, here's a the debit card for food, and you have, in six years, you have to report to court for a hearing. That, that's not border security. I that's wouldn't just, think so. No, and that, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, people can d deny it, but this is what's happening at the border. Most of the mainstream press is not covering it. I mean, you, look at, you can look at some of the cable and over-the-air me news media. They are not covering what's going on there. Uh, Dick, in, in, in this particular aspect of your comments, uh, there's a piece of it that really concerns me. And um, I, I know a number of uh, people who have tried to find out, for example, how many undocumented or illegal immigrants are in the state of Rhode Island, and they can't seem to get an answer from anyone in government. No kidding. I I agree with you, John, and here's something interesting. I did find a website where they, they tried to estimate the number of undocumented people, we'll call them for political correctness, in each state, and they estimated there are 47,000 illegal immigrants here in Rhode Island. In Rhode Island. That is costing the state over $80 billion a year. Okay. As you pointed out, when our forebears came here, especially, through, I'm not sure about the West Coast, but certainly coming through Ellis Island, as you know, they were tested, as you said, especially for tuberculosis. If you had yes, TB, indeed. you're going home. That's right. Um, and they had to do that. Today, they walk across the border, even when we were on COVID walk, lockdown, they weren't being tested for COVID. Yeah. They were coming through the border and being dispersed uh, around the country. The rest of us were told, wear masks, stay six feet apart, and don't get in groups larger than 250. You know, it, the whole thing doesn't even make sense when you get down to it, John. And I mean, I, I just don't understand how people looking at this can say, well, this is acceptable. I just don't understand it. Uh, you know, Dick, I remember when I uh, was in school and. Uh, we had history, you know, one year after another after another. And, and, and I, I remember my history teachers saying that um, there's a few important things that uh, tell you what a country is. It has borders, it has a language, and has a few other things. 
Have those things been thrown to the wind at yes. this point? Yes, they have, John. And that's unfortunate because we're, we're almost becoming a, a tribal society. And I think we all have to respect where people are coming from. I went to uh, for a walk uh, late yesterday afternoon in the uh, evening hours when it got a little bit cooler. And I was over in a, a public park area and there were a lot of people having cookouts and everything. And there was Spanish music playing and there was rap music playing. It was fine, it was a, a melding, right? And there was a group of, of Muslims there. And the, and the women were all, had their heads covered in shawls and everything. The men were dressed a little more casually. Uh, it's okay, so, that, so that's their custom and belief. That's fine, of course. everybody accepts that, but yet, I think the, the goal should be to become Americans. You can, real, religion is one thing that we respect, that we should. But um, the other things that we bring have to be melded. And there was an American culture, and I use that in the past tense, because it seems that we are being splintered apart into special interest groups along ethnic and racial lines um, that is going to be the end of the country. A civilization cannot stand, and that's historically correct. You cannot be a multicultural uh, nation. It just doesn't work. And Dick, as you were saying that, my thought was, and that process is the undoing of a nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hist historically what happens. Um, so somebody has got to put their arms around this. Now, Donald Trump has said, I'm going to re-secure re the border. And the question is going to be, he's talking about deporting all these people that are here illegally. That's going to be a Herculean task. Um, the last time we had general amnesty was under, believe it or not, Ronald Reagan. Hmm. And he said, okay, I'm going to, there's, there, I forget how many immigrants, that were nowhere near what we have now. And he said, all, they can stay here as long as they register. And uh, there was a case in Rhode Island that you may recall. There was a gentleman from, I believe it was Lebanon, who had opened a pizza place in Exeter that was very popular. He was a very hardworking gentleman. And he just, he didn't bother to register. And guess what happened? Got deported. It, they came, INS came and said, you're leaving because you're here illegally. And there was a big uproar. He's a fine man. He's got a family here now. He doesn't know anybody in Lebanon. I'm sorry, those are the rules. You know what the rules were. You could have stayed. All you had to do was register. That's all. And that was not enough. Yeah. Now, President Biden has turned around and, and again in defiance of the Supreme Court and said, I'm going to create the make th half a million people who are here now that have overstayed their visa, they're here uh, illegally mm -hmm. for one reason or another. Yep. But if they've been here 10 years and they married an American or, and if they have children, they're gonna get a green card, which means they now have permanent resident status with a green card. Um, he, the Supreme Court, I don't think you have the authority to do that, but he's doing it anyway. Yes. So, you know, when they talk about Donald Trump being a threat to democracy, we have to look a little closer to home, I think. Indeed. The other major um, thing I think we have to talk about is inflation. Now, the Biden administration seems to be trying to dodge that uh, whole subject, but I'd, I'd like to point out that it took 200 years for the United States government to amass a national debt of one trillion dollars. 200 years. Today, one trillion. One trillion. Today we add a trillion dollars to the national debt every 100 days. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> now, the national debt stands at about 35 trillion dollars. The Congressional Budget Office, which is supposedly nonpartisan, came out last week and projected that by the year 2034, the national debt will be $50 trillion. That's 120% of the gross domestic product, product, which is the value of all goods and services produced by the economy. And Dick, I, I, I think it's worth repeating that this is 
a government agency that's saying this, not yes. someone who's oh, no. speculating no. this, that, and the other. This is directly from the government. From the Congressional Budget Office. And um, the debt has to be, there's interest on this debt. Of course there And the is. way we're going, the interest on the debt will become the largest line item in the budget. It will surpass Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and defense spending. Just think about in, what I in, just said. In, in total? In total. In total. Yes. So if that's going to happen, this, the, the economy just can't deal with it, John. No. The, the federal government takes in about $3.6 trillion a year, this year that's projected. We're spending far more than that, and they keep spending this money. They're sending it to Ukraine, they're sending it to Israel, they're giving it to this one, that one. We don't have the money to give away, but they're writing these checks. This, this is insanity. And Treasury Secretary Yellen testified uh, before a Senate committee recently, and they asked her, well, well, actually one senator asked her, it was Kennedy of Louisiana, who's kind of an amusing guy the way he asks questions. Yes, I like him. <laughs> he said, uh, why is the Treasury paying 5.4% interest on 90-day notes, but only 4.4% interest on 10-year bonds? Why aren't you funding this with 10-year bonds and saving 1% on the total? And Janet Yellen, I guess she's a lovely lady, but I mean, she didn't really answer. And he, I mean, I don't want to get the audience to, to start having their hair hurt by this stuff, but this is called inverting the yield curve, which means the rates being given on short-term debt exceed the long-term debt. Now, put it in terms we understand. You and I have a homeowner, a mortgage on our home. That's long-term debt. Yes. But if we go to buy a car, over three years, Short term. that's a shorter term. Yeah. So we would expect to pay a higher rate of interest on the short term debt and than on the long term debt. And uh, in the, the long term debt actually carries a greater risk with it. Now Yellen is saying, well, we think that we're issuing the short term debt at a higher interest rate because when the, th the three months is up, the interest rates might be down. Well, that, by that logic, why don't you just do it all by three months debt and, you know, see what happens. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to the way the country's finances are being run, John. And I think, um, I don't know if people can understand that. It's a, it's a very difficult issue. People's eyes kind of glaze over when you talk about this, but it's a serious problem. It is indeed a serious problem, and it, it affects every American who pays taxes. Absolutely. There's no question. I mean, um, there's, well, I don't want to get into the Laffler curve and all that stuff, but I mean, Trump has already said, I'm going to reduce taxes again when I come in. To progressives on the left, this, this is like, oh gosh, that, that, that means we're going to get less money in. No, it doesn't. A lower taxes have historically been shown to create a driving force in the economy, which ultimately results in greater revenues to the government. That's, that's a historical fact. That's the historical dynamic yes. of that. Yes, Dick. <laughs> and I think, you know, I think whoever the next administration is, I want to uh, try to get back uh, to this whole subject of what's going on internationally, John. This is... Most people are t talking about the debates, they're talking about other things, and you know, it's vacation time, and uh, you know, s s it's summertime, the living's easy. But the world is in serious trouble. Um, yesterday was Trinity Sunday in Russia. This is a very uh, kind of a sacred holiday to the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's a big holiday. So it's a big, big people go to the beach, and they, you know, it's a, it's a big family event. Yesterday, Ukraine launched a missile loaded with a cluster bomb warhead at a beach in Russia. And over 150 people were killed and maimed, including children. Now, this particular missile is an American supplied missile. It is also has to be, the targeting is done by American satellites.
Mm. And there are security codes on these missiles that we don't share with other countries, which means before that missile could be launched, Amer some Americans, I don't know if they're military or CIA, uh, or black ops guys, were required to arm the missile. Cluster munitions are precision guided in the sense that they can be directed at a very specific location. But a cluster bomb sends out all these little, they call bomblets, over an area and indiscriminately kill and maim everybody around. Now they did this at a beach of all places. Mm. And I think well, last time we spoke, I mentioned that President Biden came out and authorized Ukraine, President Radimsky, that to use American missiles against military targets in Russia. Now, now, now Dick, may I ask you a question sure. uh, about that? Because this, I think, will be extremely important to our viewers to understand, I'd like to understand it. This seems to me to change the nature of our involvement. Absolutely. And, it's, and, and I seem to recall Putin made a statement not too long ago relative to, and, and, and I'm sure you'll be able to explain it better, but if certain items come from a particular country or are fired from a particular country, then that, that country that becomes, is an enemy. Yeah, and, and that location that it's being fired from is a target. Now, the Russians, believe it or not, are, have, have been very clever. They've taken a whole inventory of thousands of what we call dumb bombs. And they have devised a system to make these things, they're called glider bombs. And what happens is, they're, they're, right now they're using 250, 500 pound, and 1,500 pound bombs. They're working on a 3,000 pounder. Oh my word. But what they do is they have a device, they've got a system where they attach wings to these dumb bombs, and they can be guided by, by their GPS system into targets. Now, they're not very effective against a moving target, like say a tank or something, but, but against a stationary target, they're, um, they're devastating um, because a lot of these buildings that you see that are all like burned out and crumbled in a lot of some of these cities that have come under attack are, is the result of these glide bombs. And those bombs can actually be launched by Russian aircraft while they're still in Russia. And they can still glide over into the target in Ukraine. Hmm. Now, Putin did come out before this ev event of yesterday and he said, look, I'm willing to negotiate um, with two conditions. First of all, the Russian speaking, the ethnically uh, ma majority Russian, they call them obelisks, but we call them counties perhaps or states. Mm -hmm. But these easternmost countries that are dominated by Russian speakers, ru ethnically Russian, that we have taken possession of become part of mother Russia. We're not giving them back which makes sense, they paid for them in, in blood. I mean, the people, you know. And then the second thing is, Ukraine has to pledge not to become part of NATO. Those are the two things we will start with. But even then he said, there's some room for negotiation. Mm. And what did we do? Our esteemed um, two guys who seem to be leading the charge here, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and Secretary of State Anthony uh, Tony Blinken came out and said, "No, non starter. We're not going. We're not going to do that." So this is escalating, and it's only a matter of time. We're we have to see. Putin Putin has been fairly patient with this, but he's going to become under pressure if we start. We if the Ukrainians start using our missiles and targeting civilians in, at a beach. Um, he can very easily say, well, okay, I'm going to start using them against civilian targets over there, or I'm going to start taking out some of these, these targets that um, we will locate where those things are located. And if there are Americans there working on them, arming them, for example, we're going to, they're going to be killed. I mean, it all sounds like the posture that um, those involved are taking is simply leading to greater escalation. Well, 
when President Biden was at the G7 conference recently, he met with Vladimir, Vladimir was it Zelensky, and they signed a mutual defense pact. What well, most people don't realize, and we, we keep referring to uh, Ukraine as an ally and as a democracy. Zelensky's term as president expired in May. And what did he do? He suspended the elections. Mm. And any news, news reporter who, or editor who wrote a, in opposition to this has been put in jail. The same democracy, folks. I hate, this, I hate to clue you in. And the fact that people have to be aware of the billions of dollars that we are putting into Ukraine is not all for military. We are paying the salaries and the pensions of the bureaucrats in the Ukrainian government. Wow. Yeah, wow. I mean, people, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, people may watch this, John, and say, well, uh, I'm, I'm uh, anti-Ukrainian. I'm not. I don't, I don't think that the violence that was started by Putin, it might have been justified on the basis that we kept e aging NATO closer and closer, and that wasn't the deal that was made. And I think the initial little thrust was really to show the West that, hey, this is serious. You guys better back off. NATO better stay out of the Ukraine. But it's escalated because we immediately jumped in, and, and I saw our Senator Sheldon Whitehouse at an event on Memorial Day, and he's walking around with American and Ukrainian flag on his lapel. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a United States senator, okay? Um, and he really shouldn't be wearing the flag of another nation on his lapel. I'm sorry. Um, that's just my opinion. But... We immediately jumped in and said, oh, because the prevailing wisdom in the Biden administration is that Russia is like it was 50 years ago. And we can, we can push them around. No. It's not, because I want to talk a little bit about the Middle East again. We talked about Israel, uh, what was, what's going on there. But I want to point out that the Houthis, which is, which is a, just another terrorist group in Yemen, is now using unmanned, guided speedboats that are very maneuverable. With, they pack a 330-pound warhead in these things, and they sunk a very large commercial vessel in the Red Sea. Hmm. All right. So you say, well, so what? Well, guess what? We can't even take care of a band of rebels that are using speedboats to sink these things and, and firing missiles at them. The commander, the Eisenhower, I think it's the Eisenhower Battle Group, USS Eisenhower, a nuclear uh, attack um, mm -hmm. aircraft carrier, and its battle group have been on station there. And he's, he's wanted to go after these targets, and he's been held back. So guess what's happening? I have no idea. The Eisenhower's coming home for repairs. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, so I guess we're going to declare victory and come home now or there? I mean... <laughs> What is this administration doing, John? I mean, they could, uh, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. And the commander-in-chief doesn't seem to be in charge. All these little steps, if you will, just tell me that it's widening. It's getting bigger. Sure. And the bigger it gets, the more dangerous it becomes. In Israel, they are now attacking to the north. They are attacking Hezbollah in the north. The last time Israel did that, they had to withdraw. Mm. And now, Hezbollah is much stronger than it was then. They have over like 150,000 missiles and, and, and guide, precision guided munitions in their possession in Lebanon. And where are these missiles coming from, Dick? Uh, it's obviously that Iran is, is a big supporter of Hezbollah and has Hamas. But the question is, where, where is Iran getting the money? Let's see, who is it that released $20 billion or so of, of their assets that were frozen? Hmm. Well, okay, so what, the fact is they have them. Yes. And Israel is now like poking up to the north because guess what, John? They can't seem to get rid of Hamas in the south. They're, they're taking casualties. Yes, they're making advances. 
they are killing a lot of civilians to uh, get a few of these um, Hamas terrorist brigades. Um, and I said the, the last time I mentioned this, uh, the so-called Hannibal Protocol that they use. The policy of the Israeli Defense Force is if you can take out one terrorist and you're going to take out 10 civilians, that's an acceptable exchange. If the American forces ever had that in the rules of engagement, the American people would be furious. I believe if, so. And we've had, during our adventure in Iraq and in Afghanistan, we had, we had soldiers and Marines court-martialed because of taking retaliation against uh, a, a building, for example, where they thought a terrorist was located or had retreated to who had fired upon them, and when they went after it and civilians were killed or wounded, they were court-martialed for doing this. And of course, Dick, that is uh, something that a terrorist group would take advantage of. Of course. I mean, so the, the you know the 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 rules of law don't uh, a war don't apply to everyone equally. No, and and the rules of war. Every nation or every armed force are they have rules of engagement yes. as to when they can do certain things. Uh, the United States does not allow its troops to go indiscriminately into a village and begin shooting everybody in sight because there might be a. Uh, a bad guy, an insurgent among the group. That's not acceptable. And it should be unacceptable. Of course. Um, so th there's also you know, this idea of a disproportionate response. Um, so it's, you know, it's something that should weigh on our, conf our consciences. Um, but I don't know, to get, swing back a minute to the, the election, the next commander in chief, whoever it is, is going to have to deal with these things it's somehow. It's going to be a huge problem for whoever that person right. is. Right. I mean, Trump has already come out with something. Um, he, he's also already laid out some of the goals that he has. Now, I, I think some of them are a stretch, to be truthful with you, but at least people are getting an idea about what he has in mind. And first of all, it's of course to reverse the policies on the border. Um, I think Trump could easily bring a quick end to what's happening in Israel and what's happening in Ukraine very quickly. Um, and I don't say that, uh, pe look, I want people to understand, I did not vote for Donald Trump the first time he ran for president. So please, People say, well, you're a Trump guy. You're you know? a Trumpy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't vote for him the first time. I did vote for him the second time because I did, in fact, not, first of all, let me say, let me, I do not a approve of some of the stuff he does. I don't approve of the name calling and some of the tweets that he does and everything else. But I look at the results, not necessarily at, at the man's personal cr cr crates or what do you want to call them. But the second time I did because I did not think that Joe Biden was capable of being president. Um, so that's just my, my opinion. And it, but this time around, if I got a choice to make, I think I'm, I'm making it clear who I'm going to vote for. Even though I may disagree with some of the things he's, he says about people and does and the tweets and whatnot, um, he seems to be able to get the country moving in the right direction. And under his four years, I know we had a dry, vibrant economy. The economy was growing. I understand inflation was practically zero. Interest rates were down so that people could buy houses. Um, we were not only energy independent, we were exporting energy instead of yes. importing more uh, uh, contaminative uh, oil from Venezuela to, to refine at our refineries in Houston. Yes. It makes no sense. Of course not. Um, but uh, you know, that's, uh, we'll have to see, because I'm still not 100% sure that President Biden will be the nominee, but we'll have to see. I think I saw today something that's a little bit disturbing. Some uh, Democrat operatives apparently are already gearing up for a Trump resistance movement if Trump becomes president. 
Now, by that I mean they're, they're already laying out, well, if he does this, we're going to do that. We're going to, um, you know, the presidential election is one thing, but what goes on in Congress is also very important. Yes, indeed. Because President Donald Trump can be president again, but if the Democrats control the legislative branch, he's basically a figurehead. I mean, he can say a lot of things. He has a bully pulpit, but he can't get his agenda passed because he just won't do it. And particularly in the Senate, the Senate, there's a good chance the Republicans can, um, can take better control. The House, to me, is still a big question mark. They're saying, well, maybe the House will swing over. If the Republicans control the legislative and the executive branches, I think there's a strong possibility the, co the country can be placed back on the track that it was four years ago or three years ago. And maybe that people will uh, understand that. Now, that doesn't fit with, um, th in this state of Rhode Island, which is a true blue state, um, I know there are people that actually, dis they, I mean, they despise Donald Trump, and I understand that. And they'll never vote for Donald Trump. But um, the, the election, the presidential election is decided in the Electoral College. And right now, Donald John, Don Trump is leading com fairly comfortably in most of the major swing states. There's a half a dozen, maybe seven or eight key states that will be deciding who is the next president of the United States. And depending on what happens Thursday night at this debate, could actually almost seal the election um, one way or the other and either make it more competitive or it's going to be the, the Democrats will have to go all out on the judicial front to try to do something to um, thwart Trump's candidacy on the, in the court system. Uh, you know, Dick, uh, I'm going to say something that may sound a little naive, but I, I'm basing it on the people I know. And I know many people who are Democrats and Republicans and of other persuasions that don't get much <laughs> attention. Uh, but when I listen to all those people talking, I hear a common desire that they want their government, the elected people, to work together on behalf of the people and this nation. And many of them think that we are simply not getting that any longer. Clearly, John, both sides have become more polarized and, and dug in. Um, Ideologically? Yes. Um, our system is built on checks and balances. It is not built on, okay, we're, we're all going to agree on everything. The system depends on compromise. To try to put a local flavor on this, as you know, the governor signed into law a revision in the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. Yes, indeed. He said, this is, this is a compromise that has been reached, and sure, the side that wants rat, wanted radical change is not happy. The side that says the status quo is just fine, we've got to stay the way we are, they're not happy. They're not happy. But in compromise, we have reached a meeting of the minds that is, this is a better way to go forward, and let's, let's try it this way. We can, it can always be changed later on. So that's a good example of how it's supposed to work. Indeed it is. And um, unfortunately, as you know, and, and not only nationally but locally, a lot of times the, the battle lines harden, and one side doesn't want to listen to the other side, frankly, and they just they don't care. And especially in a, in a, a state like this where the one party dominates, and I've, I've lived in a state where the other party dominated. Sure. It, it goes both ways. The, if that's so far out of balance that Compromise is very, very, very difficult. Um, I remember having a conversation years ago with for, the last Republican governor we had, a gentleman by the name of Donald Kacheri, mm -hmm. and he did serve two terms, yes, believe he it did. or not. He's a, he was the last. And I remember him saying to me, it was one night at the end of a session, and I don't know exactly why I was talking to him, 
And I said, where are you? And he, he said, I'm, I'm here at the State House. And I said, what are you doing? He said, he said, I always stay here at, when the session winds down because I never know what these guys are going to come up with. And I said, well, you, Republicans are such a minority, and you're a Republican. What do you expect? He said, at least here, if you recall, there was a point where there was a dissident group of, of Democrats that were not happy with the leadership that existed at the time. I think it was Gordon Fox. I'm not, uh, don't, I think I'm right. But anyway, so there was a dissident group. He said, with that dissident group, we can form a coalition to have some effect on the outcome. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, that's an interesting idea. So you can form coalitions uh, even in that environment of one party dominating and actually try to reach a, a compromise on some of these things. It was interesting. I was looking at the budget, and the budget is, was called the budget bill, and then it was capital A and two small a's, which means it had subsequently been amended three times, the mm -hmm. original budget. But it's still almost $14 billion. Yeah. And, and, and the, the governor budget, acknowledges we don't have any of this, I call it COVID cash. But just that we've had, we had uh, you know, uh, elected officials on this program talking about this COVID money and the, how the budget went up quickly. And they said, yeah, well, the, the risk is this is going to become the baseline. Well, by golly, that's exactly what happened. Yes. We're supposed to have a balanced budget, but I heard one reporter say, and I, I think that's a fairly reliable, reliable source, say there's, there's a built-in $250 million shortfall. In other words, it's not a balanced budget. They're passing it hoping they can come up with either $250 million more in revenue or they can come up with $250 million in savings. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to be out of balance. And you pointed in the beginning of our conversation that the federal government doesn't have a balanced budget either. Well, the federal government has one thing the states can't do. They can print money. Well, that's true. And that's exactly it? what's happening. Yeah. When, when the, between the, the Fed is supposed to be independent and the Treasury Department is not really supposed to be working hand in glove with the Federal Reserve. Most people don't even know what the Federal Reserve System is and I don't know if, we don't have time to get into it. But the Federal Reserve System is supposed to be kind of independent uh, and it's a group that's supposed to guide the banking system. They're not supposed to be doing some of the stuff that they're doing to create money. That's right. And if there's nothing behind the money except the prob promise of the government to pay, then at some point, people are going to wake up and say, well, I guess they can't actually live up to this promise. In the 1970s, you could take $35 to your local bank, probably a commercial bank, and buy an ounce of gold. Because that's what backed every dollar, yeah. was one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold. So you take $35. Today, if you take $35 to the bank, they're going to hand you $35, which is a, all it says on there is now Federal Reserve notes, yeah. which means it's a promise of the government to pay you a dollar. And the only reason it's worth a dollar is because the government says it. you can yeah. buy it. And you and I will agree, hey, John, I like that tie, I'll give you a dollar for it. And you say, okay, because okay. you can use the dollar to go and buy a pack of cigarettes or whatever you want to buy. <laughs> That's how the money works. Yes. Dick, thank you so much for calling our attention to these things that we all should, in fact, be concerned about. And I would encourage our viewers to take some time to watch the presidential election uh, coming up on this Thursday. Uh, all Americans should be watching it. It uh, would be a nice wish of mine if they all were. Yeah, well, I think, John, I want to wish, we think all our audience should have a great summer and enjoy the summer, but please, just don't put your head in the sand at Scarborough Beach and don't think every, everything else is going on okay. Thank you, folks, for watching State of the State. Thank you, Dick, for this interesting chat with you. And please join us again next time for the next edition of State of the State.